All right, welcome back to episode five of the Collection Connection, uh, the game where my brother and I pick albums. Yep, there he is, Brother Eric from the Plastic Soundwave Cult. I've been bad about introducing him at the beginning of each episode. I'm going to try and improve my uh, protocols. And so this is the game where we find connections, either obvious or arcane, anything in between, to one album in my collection to an album in his collection. We'll talk about each for about five minutes and throw it to the other. And here we go. You left off with uh, Nazareth, Razmanaz. And so I took the uh, fairly obvious route of the fact that it's a city in the Middle East. And I have a band that is another city in the Middle East. Uh, that is, as the crow flies, about less than 100 miles away, I think, from Nazareth, and that is Beirut. Uh, the Riptide. Beirut is a band that formed uh, in the latter half of the knots, the 2000s, and started as uh, a guy, Zach Condon. And the, much of the first album uh, called Gulag Orchestra, which I want to say orchestra, but it's star and not stra at the end, uh, was kind of a home recording, multi-instrumentalist that has over the years evolved into more of a full-on band. Now their sound is very, uh, perhaps eclectic, but it's an almost hipster, <laughs> but, uh, using a lot of you know real instruments it's 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 very it's like this european kind of exotic stew uh with sounds both of the middle east and france and spain and italy and the balkans and they make me think of camper van beethoven in a way in that sort of unique instrumentation that they have uh for Pretty much producing pop songs and also the decemberists which would probably be a good benchmark if people are more familiar with the decemberists in general i think they're a bigger band uh of this sort of that sort of eclectic take you know that with the decemberists it's more sort of more of a nautical bent and with beirut it's more of a kind of a mediterranean stew of sounds Lots of organ, uh, different kinds of organ, pump organ, farfisa organ, um, brass, euphonium, trumpet, trombone, accordion, if I didn't just say that, and violin, but all sort of, you know, in a, in a bazaar with two A's, like outdoor market bazaar kind of sound. Um, and so this particular album, The Riptide, was the First, well, it's the first album my CD I got from them. What I really wanted to do um, was the single for Elephant Gun, which is my favorite Beirut song, but I only have that digitally. Uh, I only have two of their albums, this one, uh, The Riptide, and then the follow-up to this called No, No, No. And very much about places, this one. So Beirut, you know, the name itself is a place. Uh, this has a song called Santa Fe, a song called East Harlem, a song called Goshen, uh, which is both in Egypt and a town in New York. I think it's probably referencing the New York one. Payne's Bay. Uh, got a song called Vagabond. They're the kind of band that you would not be surprised if they had a song called Vagabond. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I enjoy it. It's not my favorite band. Uh, Elephant Gun is a song that I love. I love Elephant Gun. Um, but the rest of their stuff, it's like good, but it, it has that, like I said, a little bit of a hipsterish feeling um, where it's, he's got a very sort of acquired taste voice, I think. 
and kind of transportive. I think Zach Condon would listen to or watch like foreign movies. I think he said, I think he said he, he grew up in Santa Fe. So he's, he's American. Um, but he would uh, watch old movies and stuff, foreign films. And that, that was the sound that inspired him to take up music. And so it's not surprising that he's sort of borrowed a lot of this you know, overall Mediterranean, you can, you know, it's like Casablanca and kind of just around the rim of the Mediterranean, all these influences. And yeah, I, I, I like Santa Fe, the song. Uh, there's, there's, definitely, there's some good stuff on here, but it's, uh, I feel like it's a little bit of an acquired taste, uh, but it's transportive. It feels like it comes from a different time and place. And it's good. So yeah, Beirut, uh, this is the Riptide. Comes in a nice cloth bound hardback CD here. So it's, it's very minimal. It doesn't, have, doesn't say a lot about anything. It's just got the basically the who plays on, the, on each track. And that's all the information uh, that came with the CD. But I will uh, throw it over to you from Beirut. Middle East cities, Beirut. Okay, here we go. Look at that. That's dynamic. All right. Day two, what do you got? All right. So uh, you brought up Beirut, never heard of those guys before, went down a rabbit hole, listened to a lot of their stuff. They sounded pretty good. They got this keyboardist, and I'm watching on one of the live showings of one of the songs. He's playing piano and keyboards, you know, a synthesizer at the same time. And then I noticed in another one that he's playing accordion. And you kind of got to do the same thing when you play accordion. And uh, that guy's name is, <laughs> we just talked about all this stuff, Perrin Cortier. Um, <laughs> so Perrin Cortier plays accordion on a lot of those songs on Riptide. And that got me to thinking, so I just Googled pop bands with accordions and it came up with a list of 20. And the only one that I had, no, I had a couple, because the ones I thought it was going to be was going to be like Toad the Wet Sprocket, but that's not an accordion. That is on a synthesizer. Uh, I thought maybe Camper Van Beethoven. No, they don't have an accordion on the album that I have. Um, but they did have... Counting Crows. Uh -huh. Charles Gillington, he plays accordion on, on this album here. I'm trying to think exactly what songs. Um, I love this album. I know it's another kind of hipster, I guess, <laughs> group. But uh, their songs are really good. Uh, Around Here is good. Omaha is one of my favorites by them. Mr. Jones, another single from them that was pretty popular. Uh, again, not my favorite song on here. Perfect Blue Buildings is such a good song. Uh, it has such a good build. Anna Begins has a really good build. Um, it just crescendos in this like achy way. You can kind of feel this pain. Anna Begins is my favorite from that album. Now, Time and Time Again is okay. And it's funny because if you broke this up into sides, the CD, the last songs on both sides are not necessarily my favorite, uh, but Rain King is really good. <laughs> Sullivan Street is really good. Ghost Train isn't bad. Uh, Rain in Baltimore is pretty good. This is a pretty good album, like if you go on a long trip or something like that, you're with the family and they don't necessarily want to rock out hard, but you still kind of want to rock out a little bit. They build up to some nice folky rock out <laughs> kind of sessions in their songs. Um, I also have the other album from them. Uh, Recovering the Satellites? 
covering the satellites. I have that one. I really like Elizabeth on that one. Um, that has uh, not as many songs as I like on it, but this one here for a debut album is absolutely incredible. And it seems to me like these guys have, uh, like they're still around, but it just seems like they just play this stuff. Not necessarily this album, but like they play their albums, but they haven't really made an album, I don't think, in a while. When I was looking on Discogs, the last 15 entries are all live recordings. Mm. Live at this place, live at that place. So it's just like, I don't know if they make new music anymore or not, or they just, you know, play it live, and then that's when you hear the new songs. I don't know. But um, they can tour on their old stuff. I mean, I, I think this is fairly timeless. I can hear this, what, this came out in like 91 or 92, I want to say. No, I want to say more like 93. I don't know for sure. But when it came out, it's just that, yeah, that kind of, when I had to work and stuff like that, it was, it was great music to listen, to work with, you know, while you're doing whatever job you're doing. Um, but it, it, it kind of has a similar, like, almost like a folk background, but with definitely with some rock and roll tones in it, you know, and that was very similar to the Beirut I found as well. Um, so I thought it was ironic that I, even though they have very different sounds, they almost seem to come from the same background. You know, that almost like street performer feel, you know, that kind of thing. But I, I don't know whether any of those guys were street performers or not, but you know, I could see these bands sitting out on a, you know, at the subway and playing away. So yeah, I have that one myself and Recovering the Satellites. Those are also the only two Cannon, Cannon Crows albums uh, that I have. So I will not have a problem listening to that. I actually pulled out Recovering the, the Satellites not too long ago. It, it has more songs I like in other Horse Dreamers Blues and Mercury and, and a few of the, the songs from that album. But uh, yeah, I, I will pull out definitely and uh, dig into uh, the, the first Cannon Crows and uh, have something for you in return. All right, well, here we go. <laughs> I'm blind! I'm blind! I'm blind! <laughs> So yesterday you had Counting Crows, a lot of directions I could have gone in, and I, I came up with a very tenuous link to kind of, uh, I don't know, push the boundaries of, uh, <laughs> of connections. Um, but they're the lead single from August and Everything After uh, was Mr. Jones, which I noted was their highest charting single. So they're not a one hit wonder, but their debut single was their highest charting single. Although it was further research revealed that it was not released as a single single, like they were trying to promote album sales. So this was like airplay. Uh, so it, it was, no, it made number five. They never had a number one hit, but it, it went to number five, but not on the hot 100, but on, other uh, like their top U.S. singles chart, which is based more on airplay than it was. So it was not an actual single single uh, in the U.S. With all that said, their debut single was their highest charting single in their home country. So I tried to come up, tried to, because this is not a thing that you can look up. I tried to think of artists who I thought maybe their first single was their biggest single their highest charting single, not necessarily best selling, but highest charting. And by keeping it in the artist's home country, which in this case is the UK, uh, this artist's first single, her debut single, was her highest charting ever single. And again, not a one hit wonder by any stretch of the imagination. Long running artist, Kate Bush.
from, I think, 1978, maybe 1979. Wuthering Heights, being the single, of course, uh, went to number one. Uh, so in, in the UK, it did not chart. So I, that's why I had to keep it. <laughs> it did not chart in the US at all, Wuthering Heights. And in fact, she only ever broke the top 40 once here in the States. And that was with uh, Running Up That Hill. Using this game as a reason both to explore some of the music uh, that's in your collection that I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, I have to confess in this case, I'm not terribly familiar with the kick inside. Uh, I had as I believe you did, uh, the whole story was, for a long time, was my Kate Bush collection. Uh, but in 2018, they remastered her catalog and issued it in a couple of box sets, of which I bought the first one. Uh, and I had the sensual world way back uh, when it was current in the late 80s. And I'm a, I'm a fan of that album. I'm still, that's my favorite. And, so my uh, partaking of the box set has mostly been the latter, the Red Shoes, uh, Central World, uh, Hounds of Love, uh, and a little bit of the Dreaming has mostly been in what I've listened to since that album, since that box set was issued a couple years ago. Uh, and honestly, listening to it for this uh, project here was the first time I, I had put the, the kick inside on. So. Uh, I was familiar with Wuthering Heights again, and uh, the boy or the the man with the child inside. That's the one in his eyes. Yeah, the man with the child in his eyes. There you go. And weirdly, as I listened to it, because it, 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 it didn't seem like it was released as a single where we were, uh, I was familiar with them heavy people, which uh, as a title meant nothing to me. But as I heard it, it's kind of a vaguely reggae uh, sounding song, but the the chorus of it was familiar to me. So I think we heard it back in the day. Uh, we were still, uh, we just moved to England, I think, when this album came out. And, but it's pretty good, it's funny. It, it, it reminds me in, in points uh, of Queen, the early Queen albums and sort of the arrangements, uh, both in the mysticism and uh, just in the sound of it. It has a very 70s sound, uh, which is, Generally not my bag, but you know, it's not bad. It's uh, just not my favorite thing, but it was good. And, and so it made me think of early Queen, which I like Queen, but again, as we've discussed on, on other occasions, I'm not the hugest fan of the early Queen albums like you are. It was good, it was a good listen overall. There's, I could, I could see uh, digging into it some more. Them Heavy People was, was a nice kind of comeback on me. And of course, uh, it was executive produced, it said, is the official credit by David Gilmore. And I know David Gilmore, Pink Floyd, was instrumental in getting the album made in the first place. He's, he was the one who discovered, uh, as it were, Kate Bush. I think she just had an in with him. But yeah, for not knowing a whole lot, I don't have, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly no authority on Kate Bush and even less so on this album. I know the people that tend to be in her fan base She's the kind of artist that can tend toward a, a rabid fan base for the people who, generally speaking, like Kate Bush, love Kate Bush. Um, but I'm more of a casual fan and I'm more of a fan of the 80s work. That's what I got. All right. Um, well, I have no clue yet right now, so <laughs> yeah. I'll have to keep looking in on that one. All right. Well, yeah, I'll flip it over to you. Oh, now I know I'm going to juice. <laughs> okay, fantastic. All right, well, we will see you tomorrow then. All right. You showed The Kick Inside, which you said was her first album. Mm -hmm. Did she put out two albums in 78? Because they have Lionheart on there as well. So, okay. So they went based on the, the title. So then it's out of order on there. But uh, that, that album had multiple covers. There's one where she's in a box, one where she's just like pulling on her hair. But the main one that usually goes out is the one that you show, which has a definite Asian aesthetic to it. 
And so I picked Private Eyes by Tommy Bolin, which has a clear Asian aesthetic to it, and it even possibly has an, an Asian in it. Not Tommy Bolin. <laughs> but uh, this is his second album. Um, it's got some great songs on it. Uh, Busting Out for Rosie. Probably my favorite song by him is uh, Post Toasty. Uh, Gypsy Soul is a good song. Overall, it's a very solid album. And uh, Tommy Bolin only made two albums while he was alive. There's a ton of his albums out, like starting in 1996, I want to say. So this album came out in 76? Came out in 76, the year that he died. He died of a drug overdose at 25. Um, he was the guitarist for a band called Zypher for a while. Then he went on to the James Gang and was the guitarist for James Gang. And then when Richie Blackmore left Deep Purple to start Rainbow, Tommy Bolin took his place and is on the album, at least one album, I know that. So he's on uh, A Taste of the Band by Deep Purple, which is, it's got uh, Coverdale, I believe, is the singer for that one. But uh, he only put out two albums. There's this one and Teaser. He only made the two albums, but apparently he made a lot of recordings. And so after he passed away, uh, there are tons and tons. I mean, like 15 to 20 albums more after he died, I guess of new material. I haven't heard any of those. I stick to his main ones that he was, that he did when he was alive. Um, just, uh, you know, a shame. He's a really good guitar player. Uh, heroin overdose. Um, I believe it was in a hotel room while he was on tour. Once again, another great talent that uh, is cut very short. Um, you know, I mean, the Chinese theming even continues on the back. But, uh, you know, as soon as I saw, every time I see the kite on Kate Bush, I think of this fan in, in this album. And so, uh, yeah, great album. Um, probably a little bit out of your wheelhouse. How much time do I got left? You got like a minute and a half. Is he any relation? Who's the T-Rex guy? Mark Bowen? Mark Bowen. Any that, relation? That, no relation at all. He's this guy's American, whereas T Rex is British. Kind of hard to think of things to say about a guy who only put out two albums. <laughs> What's the sound? It does it sound like Deep Purple. No, it does not sound like Deep Purple. It's a little bit more poppy. Um, he actually does a good job of. A lot of guys when they do a solo album and say they're guitarists. It's a little bit heavy on guitar as far as like, you know, he's going to be involved in just about every second of the song. He doesn't do that. He does a really good job of letting other people play their instruments. You get really well-rounded songs from this guy. Um, there's this one, and I said before, Teaser is his first one. Both albums, um, you know, rock-centric, but have a little poppiness to them as well. I don't think he had any huge hits. I think his biggest hit was Post Toasty, which is basically just about, you know, trying to leave L.A., you know, get out of that, the dredge of, of living in L.A. So, you know, maybe possibly inspired by Hotel California. I don't know. But uh, he has a much more rocking song as, as far as like, you know, it doesn't have that country influence like the Eagles do in Hotel California. Uh, so this is more, you know, very rock based, but uh, not nearly as heavy as Deep Purple. Time? Yep, that's time up. So, all right. Yep, that'll be new ground for me. Yeah, I'm familiar with his name, but it, I always had that question. It's like, Tommy Bowen and Mark Bowen related? I don't know. So I guess no. not. And uh, American, and he replaced Richie Blackmore and in, in in Deep Purple. So a lot of people did not like him because he replaced mm. Richie Black. All right. Well, I will uh, dive into that and come up with something. Yeah.
Thank you. There you go. All right. Go. I'll have to look and see how stupid that looked on camera. And uh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Okay, Tommy Bolin was a bit of a stumper for me. Uh, I tried to approach it from a lot of different directions. I couldn't come up with anything that felt super solid. And uh, as you noted, the most famous song, I guess, on the album and maybe a, of his career was, the, was Post Toasty, which even in the context of the lyrics, I couldn't really understand what that meant. Uh, it's like, don't let your mind post toasty and like a lot of my friends did so i mean it sounds like addiction or something but i don't know if it's a made-up thing i couldn't find it but i do know that post toasties uh were a cereal <laughs> uh even though it would be not ee -E like the song is but uh i so it's like a singular so post toasties is the cereal and a post toasty then you could argue was would be a flake of the cereal and so I thought, well, how about another song uh, that, <laughs> that is the singular of a serial? <laughs> and so uh, I thought of the song Lucky Charm off of the Apples and Stereos Fun Trick Noisemaker from 1995. Yeah, that's my stretch and my, oh, uh, did I make it? Did I make the connection? I'm not sure if I did, but... Uh, yeah, it's a good record. It's the, the first Apples and Stereo album, Apples and Stereo being a band led by uh, Robert Schneider. And he is part of one of the founding members of the Elephant Six Collective uh, that was a ton of bands that included not only Apples and Stereo, but uh, Neutral Milk Hotel, Olivia Tremor Control, and literally scores of bands that were different sort of permutations of musicians and stuff that were all sort of part of this collective group. Uh, and they started life, uh, they, their, the, their first couple of releases, they were the first ones to release something from that collective, even though Elephant Six didn't become a label un, until a little bit later. Uh, and they, they released their first couple of EPs under just the apples, but uh, like uh, always that we talked about in a, in a previous episode, um, there was already an Apples, and so they, they became the Apples in Stereo. And I think it's probably well described as lo-fi bubblegum, you know? I mean, it's very poppy. They, they took sort of an unabashed uh, inspiration from the Beatles and the Beach Boys, but it's really filtered through that early 70s psychedelia and just pure bubblegum, but a very lo-fi aesthetic. Um, there's some catchy stuff. My personal favorite album of theirs is uh, The Discovery of Something in the Moon, of a world inside. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Fun Trick Noisemaker was their first full album, and it does contain Tidal Wave, which was the song that was off that first EP. Uh, it was called the Tidal Wave EP, uh, but it's got lots of good stuff. I like Tidal Wave. I like Winter Must Be Cold is a, is a great song. Uh, and Lucky Charm is good. That was my connection. And yeah, I don't necessarily have a ton to say. They, they've released five or six albums. I have the first four of them, uh, I believe. Well, even that's not true. No, they, they had a couple. They, there was one in between this uh, called Tone Soul Evolution that I don't have. Don't really have a ton more to say. So I will say that... Uh, this is the, this is number five for this episode. So uh, you will pick up part six uh, on a choice based off of, there you go. There you go. I'll, I'll hand this to you to listen to. There you go. Enjoy it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it turned into County Crows. All right, so that's all I got. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I enjoyed the Tommy Bolin. Uh, that was uh, very 70s and a little, you know, it's not in my 
wheelhouse, but uh, it was enjoyable and made me think of the Kate Bush uh, that I also had given short shrift to uh, prior to listening to it this week, even though I own it. Uh, so yeah, on to, to broader horizons and uh, I will catch you in the next episode. Thank you.